I'd like to read with you this evening from the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 1. Beginning there in verse 1, the Bible reads like this and says, Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through the lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I should recover of this disease. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from the bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are ye now turned back? And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was a hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. From obscurity, Elijah appears for us today as a messenger of God. His character today demands attention and careful note. His authoritative preaching was punctuated by his physical appearance. Here was a man who was a rugged man of the desert. His furrowed brow revered, pierced, revealed piercing eyes, shagging locks hang from his head, a calfskin mantle draped about his sun-baked shoulders. The Bible tells us this leather belt pulled around him to hold his clothes close to him. The scripture even describes him as a hairy man, having the stamina of a workhorse and the faith of a devoted saint he became one of the most romantic characters of the Old Testament. His preaching was plain and often devastating. He thundered admonition and promise and warning to a king and to a people bent by sin and scarred by rebellion. His amazing miracles too caused men to look on him with awe and reverence. Here was a man who was so in tune with God that he could pray down from heaven rain or fire. Here was a man who was blessed by God and cared for by God. Here was a man of a noteworthy life. Elijah was a man from whom we learned great and meaningful lessons. We learned first of all the need of commitment and the importance of commitment. In 1 Kings 17 and verse 1, the scripture tells us he unabashedly appears before the king to promise a drought by the word of the Lord. As a matter of fact, over and again, he confronts this same king with his sinfulness. And it was his commitment to God and his will and word that urged him to risk life and limb on every occasion. On the other hand, from this rugged man of the desert, we learn compassion. In 2 Kings 17, verses 19 through 19, rather, the Bible tells us that the Lord told him to depart from the place where he had been hiding during the drought and go to Zarephath there to a widow. And there the scripture tells us he showed compassion and kindness. When he got there, she was outside the city gathering sticks to build a fire. The Bible says she had two sticks and she told him that she was going into her house. She had a little bit of meal, a little bit of oil. She was going to make some cakes for her and her son. They were going to eat and they were going to die. But the Bible tells us they remained with her. He told her first, make, her, make him that meal to eat and she did. And because of that, the scripture tells us that the meal did not waste in her barrel, nor did the cruise of oil fail throughout the remainder of the drought. In our selfish world, kindness and compassion are often viewed as weakness. On the other hand, he tells us of courage and the strength of the faithful. In 1 Kings chapter 18 on Carmel, he defended the glory and the majesty of God by facing off the prophets of Baal and destroying them. He called on them to call on their God to rain down fire, but of course he could not. And he, with a humble prayer to the God of heaven, rained down fire that not only consumed his sacrifice, but licked up the water in the trench round about it and burned the altar whereon his sacrifice laid. That's the strength, the power, and the courage that every child of God should have to be able to stand in every situation faithful to the Lord and dedicated to God's word. Elijah also teaches us the power of prayer. 
In James 5, verses 17 and 18, the scripture tells us that he prayed to God and ended rain for three and a half years. And at the end of that, prayed again to God and the rain would return. You and I should understand today the power that we have to bend the ear of heaven, to cause God to be touched by our plight, by our concerns, to speak to him in prayer. The Bible tells us the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He teaches also the importance of training others. In 2 Kings 19, verses 16 through 21, the Bible tells us that he was instructed to take Elisha to him, to train him, to instruct him. His protege would see him ascend to heaven, and he himself would carry on with a little band of the sons of prophets that he would train and dispatch to continue to preach the word of God. And just so today, there is a great need for instruction and for training. There is a great need for training our young ones to carry on the work that you and I have been entrusted with by those older ones who are leaving us most every day. But I'd have you note this as well. There are many great lessons that may be ascribed to him. And while these thrill us and instruct us, they fail to impress us with the true greatness of the significance of his life. His place in history is vital because he himself was a shadow of someone greater to come. The Bible tells us that here was a man whose reforming work and bold preaching was but a shadow of a great and essential work that would make the remedial life and death of Jesus Christ possible. Yes, Elijah pointed forward to John the Immerser. Elijah was a shadow of John the Baptist who would come. Prophets promised it. In Isaiah 40 and verse 1, the scripture says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight into the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough place is plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. But even more plain than that speaks Malachi in chapter 4 and verse 4 when he said, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite might the earth with a curse. Yes, John the Baptist was promised. John the Baptist was promised to come and do a great and important work, but he was done so in the figure of Elijah himself. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 17, when Gabriel, the very angel of God, spoke to John's father, he said of him, and he shall go before him of the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Again, Jesus declared the fact that John was that very Elijah who was to come. What in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 7 he said, and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what went ye out of the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. By what? But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than the prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I send you among them that are born of women. There hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. In Mark's account, he reads like this and says, But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. And so Elijah of old, as grand and wonderful and destructive as he was, really stands today more importantly as a figure of someone who was to come. I submit to you this evening that without the work of John the Immerser, without the introductory work, 
work of John the Baptist, the work of Jesus Christ could not have been successful. Here was a man who by the plan and the will of God was sent to prepare the world for Christ. The Bible reads like this in John chapter 1 and verse 17, pardon me, Luke chapter 1 where he said that he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people for the Lord. And the question is, how did John do that? How could John accomplish that? How would that be? Well, he did that through preaching. By declaring the will of God, John began to change the minds of men and to change the hearts of men. He first of all declared that Jesus Christ was indeed the Lamb of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, this Bible says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Again, the scripture tells us the same in John 1 and verse 36 when Jesus, or rather John said, Jesus said of John, John said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God indicates a substitutionary sacrifice. Brother Doug Hawkins did a great job last night telling us about the Passover. Wasn't that great? Folks, that's preaching. That's what preaching is all about. The old time preacher used to say that the Old Testament was the New Testament concealed and the New Testament, the Old Testament revealed. And that's exactly what we saw last evening. For Christ indeed is the Lamb of God. But that truth was first declared by a man named John the Baptist. He who came forward to reveal who Jesus Christ was and what Jesus Christ would do. On the day of atonement, a sacrifice was made for the sins of the people and a scapegoat carried away their sins a figure of Jesus who was to come John comes along preaching on the Jordan and saying this is that very one all the sacrifices that came before were about a shadow what were a figure of Christ who would be the final sacrifice who would take away the sins of mankind the Bible reads like this in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24 when the scripture says for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands which are figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer for himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You know who preached that? John the Baptist declared to the world that Christ indeed was the very Lamb of God. He preached more than that. John revealed to the man, to the world, that Christ was in fact the Son of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 32, the scripture says, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Unto whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. John bore record of the fact that Christ was not some man, any man, but he was indeed the very Son of God. And it was that kind of preaching that won men over. It was that kind of preaching by revealing the facts of who Jesus is that caused men to believe. In John chapter 1 and verse 40 the scripture says one of the two which heard John speak followed him was Andrew Simon Peter's brother he first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him we have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ and he brought him to Jesus and when Jesus beheld him he said thou art Simon the son of Jonah thou shalt be called Cephas which is by interpretation a stone. We know what, John, what Peter went on to become and what Peter went on to be accomplished. You know why that was? It is because John first preached who Jesus was and what Jesus could do. And I'll tell you today, folks, that's the kind of preaching we need. We don't need these lecturers. We don't need seminar speeches. We don't need men who will stand up here and just kind of drone on and on about Greek words and verbs and tenses and first one thing and another. We need men who will preach Jesus. That's what John did. And the result is men were converted. But more than that, the scripture tells us that John revealed a plan by which men could be saved. Over here in the gospel of Luke chapter 1 and verse 76 the scripture says and thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. What was John doing? He was teaching men how to be saved. He was teaching men what it took to be 
redeemed. First of all, John taught men that they must put their faith in Christ, that they must trust him. In John chapter 1 and verse 6, the scripture says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. That's the purpose of John's preaching. That's what John was doing, causing men to understand Christ and to believe in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, the Bible tells us, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There is a reward today for them that seek Christ. It's salvation. There is a reward for them today that seek the Lord. It's blessings untold. In John chapter 1 and verse 11, the Bible says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But John preached more than that. John preached repentance. Perhaps best known for preaching on reformation and a time to change, John is re referred to in the scriptures over again as a preacher of repentance. For instance, in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, the scripture says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 7, the scripture says, Then he said to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Where I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. You hear what John was preaching? Repentance. This was a time of reformation. This was a time for change. These people hearing what John was preaching, realizing who Jesus Christ was and knowing then that Christ alone could give salvation, it was time to change. It was time to repent. And therefore John urged men to change the ways. Jesus Christ himself would later say in Luke chapter 13, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But then too, I'd have you understand tonight that John preached baptism. John practiced baptism. And John believed in a baptism given to him by God that the purpose of which was to forgive sins. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written of the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Again, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 2, the scripture says, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That is, is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. What was John revealing to men? John was revealing to them with the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, that their sins could be forgiven, that their sins could be taken away. And somebody questioned and says, could John's baptism remove sin? And it could. And it did. Somebody says, how so? How would that work? How could that be? Well, just as we noted before, sacrifices have been made over and over again. You remember every year when the atonement was made, the high priest would take an animal and sacrifice it for himself. And then he would take an animal and he would confess over that animal all the sins of Israel and take it out to a land not inhabited and that animal would be released out there in the wilderness. And then he would take an animal, a lamb, and sacrifice that for all the sins of the people. The Bible tells us he would take the blood of that lamb and he would go into the holiest of holies and there he would sprinkle it before the mercy seat and upon the mercy seat and this was an atonement for all the people. But there was a remembrance made every year. There was a remembrance made every year of those sacrifices. And as Doug pointed out last night, those sins were rolled forward for a year and rolled forward for a year until ultimately they were rolled at the foot of the cross. Well, here's where John comes in. Right before Jesus Christ dies on the cross, John comes out of the wilderness preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and preaching repentance and preaching who Jesus is. Men come to him, they submit to him, and they're baptized with the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Are there sins forgiven? Yes. When? When Jesus died on the cross. 
That's when their sins were taken away. For in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 3, the Bible says, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Therefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had his pleasure therein, which were offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. His blood, as it were, flowed backward, removing, removing the sins of the Old Testament and of the past, and it flows forward today. When men submit to the Lord in baptism, they have their sins forever washed away. That's exactly what John was preaching. That's what John was revealing to the world. But then too, very quickly, John declared the kingdom that was to come. The kingdom that was to be established. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, the scripture says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The establishment of the kingdom of heaven was now very close. John would not see it. Jesus preached it, and yet he himself would not see it in his day. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, the Bible says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yes, one day the church would be established. In Acts chapter 2, on the first Pentecost, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the church was given to the world. The Bible says, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. All of these things that John preached sounded familiar to the world when Christ began to preach. When his disciples began to march out of Jerusalem declaring the gospel of Christ, this word had been preached to the world there. And in that, John was preparing the people for the coming of Jesus Christ. That gospel was effective then and it's effective today. Yes, the reforming work of John the Baptist set the scene for the arrival of Christ and his apostles. He would make ready a people for the Lord in the fact that many of his disciples formed a core group of believers who Christ would send around the world declaring his gospel. But I first get a glimpse of the amazing John the Baptist when God called a prophet out of the region of Nephtali from a village called Tishba. And he set him to rebuke kings, to instruct Israel, to bless the poor. And we call him today Elijah the Tishbite. 